Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Funky Brain Podcast. And my name is Dennis, and this is my Funky Brain. We have Mr. James Arthur Ray on the podcast. For those that don't know, he's one of the world's foremost leadership and performance advisors, worked with over a million people from 145 countries, author of six internationally best-selling books, including his New York Times bestseller, Harmonic Wealth, The Secret to Attracting the Life You Want, and a co-author and contributor to the internationally acclaimed movie, The Secret. Mr. James Arthur Ray, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, Dennis. Thank you for having me. We're dealing with challenges like we all are right now. It's a rocky time in our world, and we're doing our best to dog paddle, to swim, to rise above it, and and all those things that that we must do right now. Yeah, and that's great. You know what? When we were talking last time, you brought to my attention that I hadn't heard before about the four turnings, and I love that, and I brought that up to one of my friends was one of my like accountability partners in life and we were talking I was like have you heard about this because I brought up my theory was that you know what I you know everybody says oh the world's so screwed up right now we're dying everything's crazy and my thing is like I think it's always been screwed up I think it's always been very divisive you know Republican Democrat black white everything is like one side or the other and everybody hates the other person and I think it's just more publicized now but then you brought up the fact that these four turnings And explain that to me, because I think it was fascinating, and I've since looked into it, and I'm on board with it as well. Yeah, there's a book called The Fourth Turning, and I've read it at least twice, if not three times. And it's written by, I believe, Straussman and Howe. And what they've done is they've they've tracked history, and they tell us what the ancient traditions tell us is that everything is repeating patterns. And in fact, fractal geometry tells us that, that everything is repeating patterns. And probably one of the, here's another guy I'll turn you on to is if you don't know him, his name is Yuval Harari, probably one of the, the smartest guys on the planet right now. He's from Israel University and he's a, he's a futurist as well as a historian, which is an interesting mix. But his whole position is that we can understand the future by studying the past. And the point is, is that we go through cycles, according to Straussman and Howe, about every 80 to 90 years. And there's this massive buildup and increase. And then there, it comes to a point where there's a breakdown and a rebuilding again. And this is not new with them either. I mean, if you look at Hinduism, Hinduism talks about the yugas. And there's four yugas in Hindu, Hinduism, which is this increase from, from great goodness to great badness, if you will. And then there's a breakdown and a cleaning up and it starts over again. So what, what we're dealing with right now is the cleaning up. And, and I think I may have already shared what every significant breakthrough, if you check history, is always preceded by a breakdown. And, and there's, the breakdown has to happen, but the breakdown is really the tough part. And we all go through it. You know, it's like we all have these tough times in our life. I'm currently having a, one of the hardest periods of my life. And I've been sober for 17 years. You know, a lot of people think you get sober or clean or, uh, you know, you change your addictions or clean your life up and the world just opens up and everything's perfect. And that's not the way life goes. And I know you understand, too, going coming from humble beginnings all the way to the top, back down to the bottom and then rebuilding. So tell us a little bit about the rebuilding process. Well, the rebuilding is tough. You know, sometimes it's it's easier because if you look at millionaires who lose everything, they typically get it back very quickly because they already know how to do it. See, here's the thing. Everybody wants to know, how do I do it? Nobody knows how. You know, Stephen Jobs didn't know how to build Apple until it was done. Nobody knows how until it's done. And so how is the most ludicrous question we can ask. How is not our job? How is up to the universe and up to the process? Our job is to figure out what we're going to do and, and most importantly, why it's important to us. And that why it's important is purpose-driven. That'll get us out of bed and keep us going long beyond achieving any goal. And, and so for me, the rebuilding is not easy. It wasn't easy the first time. It took me the better part of two decades to build to where I was you know, successful by earthly measures, if you will. And then it all broke down and I lost everything external. What I didn't lose was anything internal. 
thank God, which is the only thing that's truly valuable. And rebuilding now is more difficult because I've got kind of the scarlet letter that some people just won't let go of. And I get it. It'll be 11 years in October since I was involved in that terrible accident. And three of my clients who became friends lost their lives. And it broke my heart. It, broke, it breaks my heart to this day. It's been 11 years. And some people still want to pound it and grind it and they just won't let it go. And it reminds me of this, and, and you know I've studied a lot of different traditions. You see the Buddha behind me and the Shiva is from Hinduism, and the Zohar is from Judaism back here. And I don't consider myself a label. You know, you say we, we're in this grand divisive time in our life, and we are because we're defining each other by a label or by a skin color or by I'm a Democrat, which means you know, anytime we put someone into a category and label them, that's an injustice because within Democrats, there are some good people and there's some very nefarious people. Within Republicans, there's some good people and there's some very heinous people. People are people. And, and yet we tend to do this a lot, Dennis. We categorize and we label and then we, we it's, it's called reification and reification really means we turn a person into a thing, into a category. I'm white, or I'm black, or I'm male, or I'm female, or I'm de Democrat, or I'm Republican, or I'm European, or I'm whatever. You know, the labels are rampant today. And, and so for me, for many people, I've been labeled because the media has done a good job of that. And so long answer to your question, but the rebuilding is more challenging because I'm dealing with that label and it's also a challenging time in our universe right now. It, it's, it's nobody's having an easy go. I, I, I don't know of anyone that's having an easy ride right now. Right. And, you know, it, it, you're right. And nobody's having an easy ride right now. And, you know, to get to the level of success you were, it's never easy anyway. And I, I talk about the, the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people. Well, there's a few, but the main one is that the successful people didn't give up. That's what it is because there's always, we all have these roadblocks, these challenges, these things that are keeping us from getting to where we think we're supposed to be or where we want to be. But the successful people, they also had those challenges. They just didn't give up. You said it took you 20 years to get there. We all have a past. You know, we you, do. You can't be 20 years old without having done something. So, you know, we all have a past and uh, it's our responsibility to move beyond it. And that's where well, we are. Well, not, if I may interject, Dennis, and, and I, forgive me for interrupting you, it's not just moving beyond it, it's to utilize it. And, and I totally agree with you about giving up. The forces of resistance must give way to he or she who refuses to give up. And the great resistance, there's resistance outside, there's resistance inside. The bigger resistance is inside. It's the self-doubt, insecurities, the fears, the uncertainties, all those things that we're confronted with right now. And so I totally agree with that. And then let me just put a different little twist on this whole thing about, about overcoming adversity. What I find in people who are, quote, successful and fulfilled is that they utilize it. They don't just get past it or overcome it. They use it as an opportunity to become bigger, better, wiser, stronger. I mean, let's face it. We grow the most in the crucible of challenge. I wish I could tell you different. You know, I, you know we don't grow the most when we're tasting the fine wine and smelling the, the roses. We just don't. I wish it were different, but it's not. We grow the most when we're pushing up against resistance. It's just like going to the gym. If you want to grow bigger muscles, you have to push heavier weight. Well, it's the same true across life. And this goes back to what we said earlier about fractal, or I mentioned fractal geometry. Things are repeating patterns, the fourth turning. When you look at how one thing works in this universe, you'll learn how everything works. So if you want to grow a business, if you want to grow your life, if you want to grow your spiritual capacity, then look at how you grow a body. Well, to grow a body, you sweat and you toil and you push heavier weights and you get out of breath. Well, that's probably what you've got, the same thing you've got to do to grow a business, to grow your spiritual capacity, to grow your awareness. Same thing, repeating patterns. Yeah, and I, I, what I've always learned 
and of course the hard way just like you're talking about is that pain and suffering is the touchstone of spiritual growth that's where our growth comes from it's like you're saying is that if i'm drinking fine wine and eating filet mignon i'm not learning anything right so everything's fine why do i need to learn anything everything's going pretty well but you know one of the things i love that i heard well it came from joel osteen and i'm not a christian person but i he's a very good speaker but one thing he said one day was you know, we're all going through some sort of struggle or pain, and I'm paraphrasing this part. But what he said, he's like, don't waste your pain. And this goes in line with what you were just saying. Your pain is there for a reason. It's there to teach you, to motivate you, to better you, whatever it is. If you're going through some sort of pain, figure out why you're going through that pain. What, what is it teaching you so you can get there to that next level? And I love that. And I'm going through that right now. And I've been using it. What happens is in my coaching practice, and I know you have one too, but it's like I deal with addiction and recovery. So what happens is like some sort of problem, and this is how I describe it, comes in through my right ear here, and it's a problem, and it's painful, and it's awful. And But I, if I process it and feel it all the way through, the sadness, the anger, the whatever it is, and I process it, it dissipates, and it comes out the other side. What happens if I don't, if it comes in this pain, it's awful and it's suffering and it gets into my head. And now instead of feeling it, I drink or I smoke weed or I eat or I watch porn or whatever it is. And now all of a sudden it's stuck in here swirling around because I never processed it. And so it's I love what you said. We need to utilize our pain to get us to the next level. I love yeah, that. it's a real shame to, to waste a good crisis quite frankly, and, and we've, we've got one that we're dealing with right now. If you look at the greatest souls throughout history, they've always experienced the greatest amount of suffering. Pick your name, whether it's a mandala or a, the Christ or the Buddha or whomever, they, Martin Luther King, the greatest souls have always, Mother Teresa, I gotta put her in there, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter who you talk about, the greatest souls have always experienced the greatest suffering because there is some degree of salvation in suffering. Now, that's not popular, but it, suffering tends to peel away the layers of BS and helps us get to the core. And here's the other thing that I tell my clients repeatedly. Pain is the mother of all growth because the fact is most of us don't ever do what's necessary and needed until we experience enough pain. You know, how many of us, let's, let's just use our current situation. How many of us have stated that our viewers here today, hey, I need a new job, I need a new situation, I'm totally bored and, and disconnected from my work, I need to make a change. Well, guess what? Life has afforded you this great opportunity. You asked for it. What are you doing with it? Well, what most people are doing with it is, is whining about it now and feeling victimized. But you asked for it. I mean, Gallup tells us that 72% of the people surveyed prior to COVID craziness were totally disengaged, totally uninspired, totally miserable in their daily work. So, and that's only the 72%, almost three-fourths of the population that was honest, right? I mean, I believe it was probably higher than that, but that's who was honest. And so now, okay, now we're whining about it and we're feeling victimized by it instead of leveraging it. And that comes back to what I said about utilization is that, that the most successful people that I've ever interacted with or coached or interviewed, and there's been many ha ha take whatever life throws at them and they don't just move beyond it. They utilize it. They make it work for them versus against them. Yeah, that's great. And now, so going back, going into your website, you have on there a quote, and I get it because I get your, e I'm on your email list too, and I get this, and it says, "We've been sold the greatest of lies." What is the greatest of lies? The greatest of lies, and it's not, it's not popular, is is that we say my body, we say my business, my car, my bank account my wife, my husband, my kids. Now, this might push some buttons for some, but you know, I've been in front of countless audiences and I asked the question, how many of you in the audience, by show of hands, have had someone you call your wife or your husband and now there's someone else's wife or husband? And hands go up all around the room and there's kind of a nervous laugh. They're not your wife. 
it's not your business. And I learned this in 2010. I had my business. Well, if it was mine, it wouldn't be gone. I had my bank account. If it was mine, it wouldn't be gone. You see, the bottom line, that's the great lie, is that we have all these things. We don't have anything. Not even this body is mine. This body is no more mine or, or doesn't belong to me any more than the car in my garage does. It's just, it's just the vehicle that I am riding in in this particular lifetime. My business is not my business. It's just, it's just the vehicle I'm experiencing and playing with. If it were my business, it'd still be, it'd still be here. Here's the, the opposite side, the great truth to the great lie is that we're all 1099 contractors to the universe. And if you know anything about 1099 contractors, which most entrepreneurs do, it's a temporary assignment. And guess what? It's going to be over way before we want it to be. We have things, we get to utilize things and play with things temporarily in this game called this physical life but they're, they're not ours. And so when we can make that switch, and it's difficult to do because we've been conditioned in the lie. If, when we make that switch, then we appreciate things, we experience things, and we're not attached to them. And certainly when they leave, which they ultimately will, here, here's the thing, again, that's hard to digest, is that every single thing you think you own is gonna belong to someone else someday, period. Everything. Every single thing you think you own is going to belong to someone else someday. And so if we can get that mindset, then we really have a happier, more fulfilled life because we appreciate things, we're grateful for things, and we realize that very soon it's going to shift. So one of the things, and I'm sure you'll agree here, but one of the things that I do in coaching is that, and it's popular in coaching, it's not so much teaching people things. It's about removing these blockages that are keeping us down or keeping us from getting there and then replacing it with healthy habits. So what do you think some of these uh, uh, blockages are that are really keeping people from getting to where they want to be, especially right now in the crisis and everything like that? The number one blockage, and this is going to seem somewhat esoteric, and yet when we get it, it's a game changer, is that this universe is real and solid. Even though I'm a big fan of quantum physics, I've studied it for over two decades, and I'm not a physicist. I've just, I've, I've pained myself through studying physics for two decades because it was laborious in many cases. But nonetheless, I knew there was something of value there for you and me. And what physics tells us is that this reality is not real, and it's not solid. Now, classic science, Newtonian science says, well, everything's built upon the atom. And yet, if you go all the way down to the atomic level, then you realize that the atom, if the atom, if, if the atom was the size of, of a, let's say, football stadium, then the nucleus would be the size of a, about a peanut in the middle of the football stadium, sitting on the 50-yard line. So, and the rest of it is space. And there's positrons and electrons, photons and electrons that swirl around it, but most of it is space. So even the basic building block of this third dimensional reality is more space than it is solid form. Now, we buy into the illusion that this is real and it's solid, and the problem with that is, then we get freaked out when someone says virus. Because we think this body, number one, the big lie is mine. It's not. We've already determined that. We think this body is solid. It's not. You put it under a high-powered microscope. There's more space here than there is solidity. But in the third dimensional reality, our sensory factors, which are the greatest prison, our five senses are the greatest prison, tell us that this is solid because that's all we can perceive. And so things go on from there. You know, this is my money. I have a dollar bill sitting sitting on my desk. My beloved wife is, is of the Persian culture, and sorry to use a label, but nonetheless, that's where she grew up. That's not who she really is, but that's where she grew up. And on, on Persian New Year, it's customary to give out a dollar bill to your loved ones. But what I what most of us say is this is money. This is not money. The reality is this is debt. Where did this come from? It came from the ethers because 
you know, we all got this, this, did you get the $1,200 check from Trump? Yeah. So, so let's use that because everyone listening, unless you have out people outside the country, they're like, I want a $1,200 check. Well, not so fast because, because we all got this $1,200 check from Trump and we're like, yay, you think this check is money and you put it into the bank, but let's break this down. This is not money. This is debt. And there's very little of these floating around nowadays. There's over $80 trillion in the, in the universe or in, on this planet right now. And a small fraction of it is in coin and cash. The rest of it is electronic. Well, where's, electro where's a Bitcoin? Where is a Bitcoin? Show me your Bitcoin, right? It's in the ethers. And, and stick with me here because if you get this, again, this is another game changer. So, so Trump goes to the Federal Reserve, which is apart from the government, by the way, they, they're a standalone entity. They govern themselves and they run the world, quite frankly. They can do whatever the heck they want apart from any government worldwide. And so they go to the Federal Reserve and, and Trump says, hey, we need to get some money, however many, I don't know what it was, billions or trillions of dollars or millions at least that we need to send out to all of our people. 1200 bucks per person. And so he gives the Federal Reserve a note that says, we need this much money. Signed, Donald Trump, President of the United States. The Federal Reserve takes that note, and then they give back another note that says, here's all these millions, billions, trillions of dollars. I don't know the number, forgive me. And by the way, it's not just that, plus interest. Now, no money has exchanged hands, right? It's fiat currency. And so, by the way, here we go. Let me give you this. Here's all these, let's call it, let's call it millions, just to be conservative. It's probably billions of dollars that we're going to send out to the American public, $1,200 a person, and plus interest on something that is nothing more than this, a promissory note. And the interest will never be paid back because, because we can't. We're already so far in debt, there's no way we could ever pay, it, pay off all the debt. So now we go further in debt and, and we get a check. Well, what does that represent? When you get a $1,200 check, we say, this is my money. Let me go back to the grand illusion. This is my money. No, it's your debt because who's going to pay the interest and the debt? You are. So maybe you're not so excited about that $1,200 check because it's all just a game. And so the bottom line is this, is that money is not tangible. Nothing in this universe is tangible. Money is an idea. It was Donald Trump's idea, put it on a note. It was the Federal Reserve's idea, put it on a note, pass it out. It's an idea, it's an agreement. And by the way, that agreement can change in a nanosecond. Ask all the people in India, of some time back when all the rupees they were stuffing under their mattress and they felt like they were really set and the government got wind of this and they got upset because they weren't gaining their taxes on this money stuffed under mattresses. And so overnight they came out and they said, the old rupee is no longer valuable. We're coming out with a brand new rupee. All those old rupees were worth nothing because money is an agreement. It's an idea. And so, it's such a great metaphor, Dennis, for how we live life. And to your a long answer to your question again, what is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is that we look at what's in front of us and we say this is reality. It's not reality. It's a game. And every great tradition has told us that. And the Buddha stated once, one of the major causes of all suffering is that we don't see life clearly exactly as it is. And so the game we're playing right now, we've just leveled up to greater challenges and greater difficulties because that's how we get to the next level is to figure out, you ever played a video game? Yeah. So you go to a new level and now you got new monsters and you got new challenges and you got to find the new keys. Well, we've just leveled up to a new game and now we got new monsters and new challenges and we got to find new little secret compartments and keys and doorways. And you, go, you play the game long enough, you figure it out, and all of a sudden you graduate to the next level. Well, we've just graduated to a new level, more difficult level, and now our opportunity is to graduate further and to figure it out and to master it. Yeah, and it's all of our responsibility to do that.
Like nobody owes us anything. And, and when you see, I, I mean, a lot of your explanation, I, I really appreciate it. It's like, it's not so much what's going on. It's our perception of what's going on. It's like, how am I going to process that? Well, if I'm living in a head full of anger and fear and insecurity and judgment and all that stuff, then I'm not going to process it well. I'm not going to learn the lesson I need to learn. And I'm going to stay stuck, you know, and, and on top of staying stuck, I'm going to now even have more fear and insecurity because the world's falling apart. But the world, as we know, that doesn't even exist. And it's our perception of what's going on. I love exactly. everything that you were saying. I love, and last time we even got into like time and the size, we are just a speck in the, the whole realm of the universe as that people perceive as the universe. It's like there's no end to the universe. You know, what's at the end of the universe? A fence, a wall? Like, and who built that? Like there's nothing at the end of the universe. There's no end. And, you know, when all these little things happen, we get stuck because we think this is the end of the world. Well, we're not going to be here for that. There is no end of the world. It doesn't exist. So uh, interesting stuff. I love that. So your focus of your teachings, your, your coaching, your therapies, your speaking, like what is your main focus? What do you, who do you hope to reach? What's the main focus that you try to drive home to people? Redemption. And, and that's the title of my new book is The Business of Redemption. And if you understand what redemption really means, it means to gain or regain something by paying the price. So you go to the grocery store, let's say you go to Whole Foods and you clip out coupons. God, please don't do that. But if you're one of those people, then you give them a coup, you redeem the coupon for your discount. So there's a price you have to pay to get your prize, which in this case is a discount. So redemptive leadership, which is a, a term I've coined, redemptive is a different twist on redemption. Redemptive means to save yourself and others from evil and error. And so that's really the thrust of all my work these days based upon what I've been through and based upon what I've experienced. Because the fact is, evil, and I talked about this in my last New York Times bestseller, Harmonic Wealth, evil is just the word live spelled backwards. So to be evil is to live in a backwards way. And, and just as an aside, the word devil is lived spelled backwards. So there's some irony and not so much there. But the fact is, when you live out of alignment with universal laws and principles, which we're talking about some of them right here, then you're living in a backwards way. And most of us are living in a backwards way. We're saying the money, the digits that I see in my checkbook or in my online account is my money. Okay, well, Dennis, have you ever had a situation of going to the bank and attempting to pull out a sizable amount of, quote, your money, you'll realize it's not even there because all that's there is a bunch of notes. I mean, they, they, they give you a mortgage and they just give you this, this interest that you have to pay and, and they give you a piece of paper that you can give to the previous owner, but the bank never comes up with any money. It's all just paper transfer and idea transfers. When you understand how things work, you save yourself from evil and error. You quit living backwards and you start living forwards and you wake up and you take your power back and you eliminate, you start to eliminate, hopefully, or at least minimize your suffering and you start to maximize your happiness and fulfillment. And when you can get to the place where all hell is breaking loose around you, kind of like now for a lot of us, if not all of us, and you can still be in a state of, of some equilibrium and you can still be in center, then you really got the game figured out. Yeah, that, that is great. And sometimes some people need help getting centered. And that's where we come in. I mean, I, I, I think we all do. And I have a coach too. I, I think we all need to have that mentor, coach, accountability partner, somebody that sees things. Because I'm emotional. I'm emotionally attached to whatever it is I'm doing. So if I can have somebody who I trust look at what I'm looking at and say, that's not really what's going on. And I'd be like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I didn't see it that way. So I think we all need 
that little bit of push or direction to keep us centered. I, I think that's absolute truth because we can't take a far enough distance from our own nonsense to see our own nonsense. You, you can't see what you're looking through. You yep. have to have, hopefully, and, and this, is, this is my experience, and I have a coach too. I've had, I've had six major mentors and coaches in my life. I've been very blessed, and I have one now. And so even great coaches need a coach because you can't see your own nonsense. My experience, you need someone to coach you who's at least one logical level higher along the journey than you are. It doesn't mean they're better than you are. None of us are better than anyone else. It just means maybe they've been at it for a little bit longer and they've been through some more challenges. And here's the thing that I, I firmly believe, Dennis, for me, and your viewer can determine if this resonates, but I want my teachers, coaches, mentors to have a lot of scars because scars are a symbol of your strength. I want my teachers and mentors to have been in the arena and got the crap kicked out of them and they're still standing. And if, if, if there's so many people who are quote coaches in today's world and everyone and their dog can be a coach, you go to a three day certification and you get a little certificate and you got a phone number and you got a business card and all of a sudden you're a coach. Okay. Well, not so fast because let me see your scars. What have you done? What have you accomplished? How have you been kicked in the teeth? How many times have you been knocked down and gotten back up? Those are the things that really matter. And so it's important to choose someone who, who's been in the arena and has really done the battles because that's the person who can share with you and teach you all the mistakes they've made because they've made them and they can help you avoid making the same ones. Yeah, one of them, I, I saw this meme, maybe you've seen it too, and it made a lot of sense to me. And it shows a guy down in a hole. He's down in this pit, and he's all like hunched over and scared and feeling like shit. And, and he's like, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this hole. And up on top of the hole, there's, there's a, another guy there, and he goes, here, give me your hand. I was just in that hole last week. I'm going to help get you out of there. And yeah. that's what I think of when you're saying that. It's like, I want somebody who understands what it's like. Like, what, you know, I don't know if you had an addic addictive background. I don't think you did. But like, you know, I know when people get sober, or clean or whatever, they, some people go to church. And those, that's great. Like, you, those, you can go to church and those people will hug you and love you. And they'll be there if you call them and we'll take you out for coffee and stuff. But those people don't know what it's like to drink until you throw up blood. And then wake up in the morning and cry and say, I'm never doing this again, and then start drinking again. So I want, when I'm talking to somebody who, to help me get out of that pattern, I want somebody who's been there that knows what it's like to wake up and cry and say, I'm never doing this again, and start drinking again, and how they got through that. So I understand completely what you're saying. If you can go back and talk to your 16-year-old self and be like, hey, little James, what would you tell that guy? It's going gonna, it's gonna to all work out. I love it. You know, you're go always going to be, and, this, and Dennis, this came to me several years ago. I was in a certification to learn how to facilitate firewalks. I used to do all those experiential activities, not, not those physical experiences, physical metaphors anymore because of what I've been through and the, the risk is just too great. I, I'll leave that to others. But I was, I was out in the woods, I was in this five, five day certification, and I was really at a low spot. I was sitting on a rock up in the mountains, and this voice came to me and said, you know what, James, you've always been guided, protected, and loved. And I sit there with that for a moment, and I look back across my life, and I recognized it was true. And even up to today, you know, with all the, the meltdown and the tsunami I went through in 2009, you know, the state wanted 30 years. And if they'd have gotten what they wanted, we wouldn't be talking here today, Dennis. So I'm so grateful that I'm here to, to talk with you. I could still, if the state would have gotten what they want, I'd still be sitting behind bars. And what I realized is that I got two years, not 30 years. And so I was still guided, protected, and loved, even though it wasn't easy. And even though I went through a hailstorm of, of challenges, I was still guided, protected, and loved. And when I was in that, that horrific situation and environment, 
I never got stabbed. I never got beaten. I never got raped. I, I came out alive. And, and when I went in, I didn't know if, if that would be true or not, but it is true. And so that's what I would tell my younger self. It's going to be okay. Just have faith. Just keep moving forward. Here's the last thing I'll say to that with guided, guided peace, because most of us want to be able to see six months, a year, three years into the future. But there's an esoteric axiom that says, that goes like this, living from that will to good and guided by its infinite wisdom and understanding, I am guided moment by moment along the path of liberation. Now, the moment by moment part is what I want to emphasize because most of us want to be guided year by year or decade by day. Well, it doesn't work that way. What do I need to do tomorrow to move my life and my family and my household and my business forward? I'm not really sure, but what I know is that I'll be guided moment by moment if I just stay open and it's kind of like driving across the desert in the dead of night. The headlights shine, what, maybe 12 feet out in front of you, and there's no lights, and it's pitch black, and you can only see 12 feet. So you drive 12 more feet, and then you can see 12 more feet. And you drive 12 feet, and you can see 12 more feet. And that's what we have to learn to develop and have the faith to just go, you know, take the step day by day, moment by moment, and it's all going to work out. Yeah, I had a teacher years ago early in sobriety because sobriety and recovery, it's not about like just stopping drinking. It's about growing up and looking the world in the eye, being honest and open and willing to change. And uh, but when you first do that, it's really scary. And I remember talking to my friend, his name was Fred, and this was like 16, 17 years ago. And um, I'm like, oh, I need to fix this and my finances, my health, my relationship, everything, the whole, my whole world. I need to fix all that. You know, like, how do I do it? And he goes, right now. Yeah. Right now. And he's like, you know, stay where your feet are. And I'll never forget that. And I, I have it written down and I look at it all the time. I'm like, I'm on the past. I can't fix that stuff. I can go back and change some, or fix some of that stuff over time. But I'm out there, and here's where I am right now. My feet are here. I need to stay here. I can't project what's going to happen in the future. I might not be here tomorrow. So I can't worry about that. So I need to stay where my feet are. And then also to piggyback on that is like do the next right thing. I would like to make $10 million in the next couple of years, but the next right thing is this. You know, maybe sometimes the next right thing is like go get some ice cream. You know, they take care of yourself. We don't know what all these steps are ahead, but I just need to do this right now. And that's what you were just talking about there. And I love that. So closing up here, how do we want to remember James Arthur Ray? I would love to be remembered as a regular guy that I'll piggyback off what you said, do, who, who did the very best or the right thing as best as he knew how to become the best he could be and to help others do the same. If I could be remembered like that, I think it's a life well lived. I love it, man. I'm so grateful that we got a chance to chat again, and I hope we can do it again sometime. We were just talking with James Arthur Ray, and so how can people uh, contact you? The best way is jamesray.com. That's my website, and you can... If you want to literally contact us, you can go to the contact us tab. If you want to just see what we have to offer, we have, you know, free free introductory coaching sessions, we have we have online programs and entire learning systems. We have a lot of opportunities on jamesray.com and I'm all over social media. I'm I'm James Arthur Ray on Instagram, James Arthur Ray on Facebook, James A Ray 11 on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn, so it's not that difficult to find me. Well, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, stay safe out there. And I look forward to next time. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. And stay strong. You know, you're going through the turbulent times yourself right now, and you're going to come out on the backside and it's all going to look completely different. You're going to be stronger and a better human being as a result. Thanks. So, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Keep all doing right. great work. I will, man. And thanks everybody for tuning in to Funky Brain Podcast. Have a great day today. We'll talk to you soon.